episode of Peephole Pictures, we're looking at Memories Within Miss Aggie from 1974. I knew you'd come in the evening. First time you come, I had beautiful golden hair. You never had no golden hair. Strong and handsome man. And you, you had sparkling eyes, like a princess, a real princess. I wasn't bad at the time. You found me in that house. You don't hate me for it. Don't the inception of this episode came from a recent uh, 50th anniversary screening of the film uh, in New York that had uh, Gerard Damiano Jr. and as well as Gerard Damiano's uh, daughter, Christar Damiano, in attendance for a screening and a post-film Q&A. So it felt like an appropriate time to uh, bring this one back into the conscious. And um, ironically, I was struggling to remember a lot of the film. It had been a couple of years since I had seen it originally. This is only my second time viewing it. Um, but with this time, having the context context of some more information as well as being able to look at this film uh, with other films in mind having seen it uh, having seen those um, since uh, it's going to provide some different kind of um, retrospectives on the film so here we have it 1974 this is the same year I believe as the deep throat trials um, that lasted until 76 I believe don't call me on that but it's a significant year for Gerard Damiano nonetheless I mean Deep Throat at this point is a huge success there's a lot of talk there's a lot of controversy behind it um, now this isn't his follow-up to Deep Throat he would do Meatball from the same year 72 uh, then uh, at, at, you know a huge success as well The Devil and Miss Jones in 1973 and then previously in 1974 Legacy of Satan before coming on to Memories of the Miss Aggie, uh, one of his more darker kind of films, and almost plays out as the sophomore film and almost an unofficial kind of dark trilogy when you have uh, The Devil and Miss Jones, Memories of the Miss Aggie, and then Story of Joanna, both of which, Story of Joanna and The Devil and, Devil and Miss Jones, would make uh, for their own episodes. I mean, you have Harry Reams in both The Devil and Miss Jones and and Miss Aggie, and I don't, and no, he was not in Story of Joanna, but either way, so we have this film right here, and Damiano is basically, you know, he, Deep Throat's getting a lot of talk, he's getting a lot of money, and I think there's a lot to speculate about his kind of post-Deep Throat um, career, because now, or I'm saying his, his immediate post-Deep Throat films, because the fact of the matter is that he follows it up with a success like The Devil and Miss Jones, uh, which is such a total, uh, tonal, total and tonal shift from Deep Throat, this kind of plays right into it as well. Memories within Miss Aggie. Uh, it has a revolving door of actors and actresses in this. We have uh, a couple different actors and actresses playing uh, the same character. So we start off at the beginning of the film with actually um, two non-adult actors here. We have uh, Deborah Shearer, who's playing Aggie, and Patrick L. Farrelly, or Farley, yeah, Farrelly, who's playing the character Richard. Um, we open up on these really just terrific, beautiful winter landscapes. And ironically, I actually got the fan on over here recording this in uh, the end of May. So it's at the uh, about uh, beginning of summer. So I guess that's the irony of it all. But we see Aggie living a uh, lonely, kind of isolated existence. This house that she's in, this like kind of barn, it seems kind of cut off. There are just these, you know, open roads. It, it seems all very cut off from... Uh, at least a distance away from, you know, a town or at least enough away where there's really nothing around. She's seemingly on her own, but she has her husband, lover, uh, Richard there. And uh, they have a bit of a strange relationship because Richard is, uh, you know, he's sitting in this chair. Uh, you know, they're both getting older. Aggie is saying, you know, she's, she's trying to remember the times that, or the time that uh, the two of them met. And um, there are some cryptic dialogue coming from Richard, um, some insinuations as the film plays on. And then from there, we get uh, a revolving door 
of actors uh, playing these characters. So in the first segment, we have uh, Kim Pope, who plays the first incarnation of Aggie. We flash back to her at the bridge. She has a meet cute with Richard, played by the great Eric Edwards. And um, from the rest of the film there, we also get um, Darby Lloyd Raines and Harry Reams and Ralph Herman. And um, uh, oh, I'm blinking on my name here. I apologize. Um, but we go through these uh, possible meet-cutes of when Aggie met Richard, or may have not met Richard, as well as something darker beneath the surface. Um, and I think the film, it, it got a lot of attention when it came out. Um, you know, it was a divisive film. I, I, it got reviewed in actually some pretty mainstream publications like the New York Times. Uh, Vincent Canby wrote a pretty notoriously uh, uh, negative review of this film. He was very harsh on the film. Um, but watching this film, I think more so, and I'm not even going to compare it to, to The Devil and Miss Jones because that, that's its own film in its own right. Um, this film of his post-Deep Throat work, I think really kind of shows... Uh, how strong of a director Damiano really was, how he didn't let Deep Throat, which for all intents and purposes is not a, is not a film that's known incredibly well for ex, it's not known for its directing skills I mean, the thing with Deep Throat that I've always come back to is that the strongest part of that film is Harry Reeves' performance because his charisma shines through when he's saying this really quirky and funny dialogue bouncing off Linda Lovelace and the other actress who I apologize who plays the nurse as well he's the one who really kind of steals the show and he's able to whenever he's on screen, not just in that film, but in this film as well, even though he's not playing a comedic here, he has an on-screen presence like very few other, um, uh, I would say even, you know, actors, but I mean more so adult actors. I think um, he and Eric Edwards both have a really strong charisma where it, it almost feels like a blanket when you when you see them in a film because even if they're not playing it uh you know sincerely or if they're not playing it kindly even you know in some more maybe like aggressive stuff they're playing it in it still is always just great to see him and it's great to see that kind of the, the strong performance that he will give and actually there's another harry ream film that i was going to come up in conversation later with this but um, so from there, we have only a couple different sex sequences in the film, and that's where it's interesting that, you know, I'm looking at the marketing for a lot of this film, and I'd say, you know, more so than Devil Miss Jones is that, you know, they're really trying to kind of put this as like, okay, you know, here's, you know, director of Deep Throat, here's this film, and I imagine that people who are going to see this film in expectation would probably be very frustrated because there's not a lot of sex in the film, and what you do have, what you are left with, is far more, um, not even totally quite avant-garde, because I don't think it's quite to that extent. I think it's still a uh, clear enough narrative to not be to not have you totally on the outside, but at the same time, the main word I want to use for for this film is ambiguous, because there is a lot of ambiguities in the film. And ironically, another film that came to mind, not just with the filmmaking style, but also with the idea of memory, which is a totally extreme kind of other uh, direction that you could take it in, in terms of bringing other films up in comparison to this, is maybe a film like last year, Mary and Bad. Now, that's a film that's far, far more avant-garde and is, and is far more, uh, in a way, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? I would say that film is less concerned with treating the audience. And you're asking, Dan, what do you mean by that? I'm saying that more so is that I've seen Last Year Marion Bad twice now. And it's one of my favorite films. I think it's just a total masterpiece. But that's a film that I draw a lot of conclusions from. Uh, whether or not any of those conclusions are intentional, I, you know, I, I couldn't tell you. With this film... I think you have the sex in the film for that kind of wider audience, but as well, there's enough here to draw you along to a conclusion while also, I mean, it's a double-edged sword, because there are, there are really two kind of mysteries going on in this film, both having to do with memory, one of which is, is pretty clear, and the other, I would say, is ambiguous, maybe almost to a fault, where we're following a lot of manipulation, and that's the other word I want to use, and also, ironically enough, in relation to um, Last Year at Marion Bad, is that's a film about memory and manipulation. Here, it's about manipulation, but who is it coming from? Because we're following Aggie, who is an un unreliable um, protagonist. 
she is having all these ideas of, you know, even from the first time she's talking to Richard and she's like, remember the first time and I had blonde hair and we have that sequence with Kim Pope and Richard's like, you never had blonde hair. I don't know what you're talking about, which is actually kind of ironic because then later on in the film, we have another flashback with Darby Lloyd Reigns uh, or a possible flashback where she has blonde hair. I don't know if that's intentional or not, but I did find it funny. I'm thinking like, all right, wait a minute. Someone's, I don't know if this is a intentional, you know, intentional uh, continuity error or not, but I think maybe they should have given her a wig or something. You know, I really, I really don't know for sure. It's, it's, it's. A lot of this film, I'm drawing my own conclusions uh, that the film intends, but then at the same time, I think there's a lot that you could find error, you could find issue with how ambiguous it really is, because I found myself following a lot of single pieces of dialogue in trying to unfold this mystery, but then I would also have dialogue that would not necessarily contradict it, but almost seemed kind of out of context it's, it's, it's bizarre at, at times I mean they're talking about, there, there's a lot of repeated dialogue as well which comes into it especially into the third act but there's one line in particular that you know uh, stood out is when it's later on in the film and I should also make sure there's no spoilers for this film or anything like that because it's a it's a film kind of to watch um, without giving away just about just about everything you know because it, it has that ambiguity but there is still a clear kind of conclusion to this film that it's better off if you... Because there was... I mean, there's one big film that I've, I hear it always compared to, and I think if I say that, it's going to... I mean, it's going to give away the ending. So, there's, you know, but it's, there's a very, very famous film that if you're looking at reviews of this film, it's eight out of ten times going to come up. But the line that, that uh, Deborah Hashira says is something along the lines of, <clears throat> I, uh, I remember you told me not to remember. I don't think that's verbatim, but it's essentially like that. Which is telling Richard that, you know, there are maybe certain memories that she is choosing to, uh, you know, to be uh, ambiguous. There's other memories that uh, perhaps not, and especially when you get to the conclusion of the film, a lot of this dialogue sort of starts to take on other meanings that can be drawn from it. But I think that there's enough, there's enough hints throughout I think that draws to something far more sinister going on, and and if you're listening to this evidence in the film, I know it may sound like like uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, trust me when I say that when you if you choose to watch the film and you hadn't seen the film before, don't exactly look don't look for an exact conclusion, but follow the dialogue in a way where you where draw a conclusion that makes the most sense to you. Because I have I feel. And a good idea of perhaps something bigger going on here, but I don't have any kind of confirmation on this. This was actually written by Ron Wortham, so I got to say this wasn't written by um, by uh, Dam Damiano. Um, and this is the only of his work that I've seen. Um, he didn't write a whole whole lot, um, but he did write um, Through the Looking Glass from 1976, which is one that I've been wanting to see. I've, I've heard good things about it. He's one of the writers on that. Um, that was directed by uh, Jonas Middleton. But the script, I do think, is really strong. Because you can hear some... You can read some of this dialogue, hear some of this dialogue, and you could say, okay, they're just repeating a lot of dialogue, or the dialogue's very on the nose, or this or that, or it's very um, maybe even melodramatic or hokey. But I think it kind of works for this manic sort of setting because Aggie is the protagonist of this, and we're cutting back a lot of times to um, the older version, which is uh, Deborah Ashira. Um, that dialogue feels less stilted and feels more, um, you know, manic, yes, but at the same time, it's like, you know, when you're talking to somebody and they're like almost hysterical, where it you can't really calm them down. They're just kind of saying these things that, you know, if you read it in a book or you saw it in a film, you'd be like, oh, you know, like, this is ridiculous. This is like nonsense dialogue. But here, I think it really works. Because um, I got to say, the acting across the front is really solid. I mean, I mentioned before with Harry Reams and Eric Edwards. Um, I mean, they're both just really solid charismatic leads, uh, or, or side characters, I should say. Um, in, ter in terms of leads, I mean, Darby Lloyd Reigns, who comes into the third um, sex sequence in the film, uh, she has one of the strongest uh, parts in the film she which I, I heard a story about the that scene not going as they planned because the actor couldn't perform um, which I don't know who that actor is by the way I it I thought it's 
was Ralph Herman, but I don't know if that's true or not. That's just what IMDb says. But I can't find a second kind of source for that anywhere, so I really have no idea. But in that sequence, I mean, the camera is staying on her, and she is saying this very explicit, very um, sexual dialogue that because the rest of the film has kind of been tiptoeing this line, when it gets to that point where this, where the explicitness and the rawness has really kind of raised itself to a point where it feels earned, it feels more earned than it does being gratuitous for the sake of being gratuitous, of just having really... Um, uh, sexual dialogue. I mean, there, there are some... Fil- I mean, this is going for something far more than just an average adult film, but, I mean, th- I remember... What film was I watching recently? I think it was... Uh, was it Inside Little Oral Annie? It had. I think that had to have been it, but I remember that film, if that's what I'm thinking of, the opening of that film... It was almost, it, it was like almost comical the, how far it was, it was got, trying to go. It, it, it like immediately kind of took me out of it. Now, that's a film that's going for something far more lighthearted. I'm obviously not trying to compare something like this, which is much more darker, uh, much more dramatic than something like that. But in the case of this film, that all felt very earned and it felt like this is a character who is almost in distress in a way. Because he, when I was looking at the facial expressions of Darby Lloyd Reigns, um, it was like. It was a weird line between being erotic and then being kind of sad. It's like this, I don't know how intentional that is, but it, it really kind of blended well for that point in the film. Uh, but going along as well, uh, one of the big things about this film, which is going to come into the connection I wanted to make sure before with Harry Reams, is the music on this. Uh, because the music on this film was done by, let me get the name up right here, uh, uh, it was done by Rupert Holmes who, uh, has, you know, reached mainstream success uh, for the Pina Colada song. Um, but the thing with this film is that, and I knew, I had known this before, but I'd never made the connection in my head, is that there was, a, there was another film with Harry Reams that always stood out with how good the music was in that film, to the point where, you thinking about it, it makes the hairs on my arm stand. And I'm going, and I made that connect. and before I knew it was him, and I didn't know he did this, but then when I found out he did this, it all connected together. I said, oh, that's right. The other film of the same year that I've talked about before, which I think will probably get its own episode in the near future, or at least at some point, is Wet Rainbow by Duddy Kane. The uh, one of the best best films from this era era with um, Harry Reams, Georgina Spelvin, and Valerie Marin. And also, uh, coincidentally enough, that's a film that also deals with um, some ambiguities. I mean, this that film less more so. It also has some of the some of the hallucinatory kind of aspects, um, but as well as. Uh, Miss Aggie, it does deal with these themes of this fractured relationship. Uh, now, with Miss Aggie, it's more so of a singular vision, but that's a film where, I know I won't go into that film now, but the whole aspect of that film is um, this complicated relationship between uh, this couple, and also, in a way, like Miss Aggie, is dealing with manipulation, whether they're manipulating this um, impressionable girl, Rainbow, played by Valerie Marin, or she is manipulating them. <laughs> it's all speculation. But that can be um, brought up more when that film is discussed. But the music here is so good. I mean, I would even call it great. You know, I'm not one who buys vinyl records or anything like that, but I know that it's been a thing where they'll re-release, you know, certain cult film soundtracks on vinyl. And, I mean, there's already been adult films that have gotten, you know, soundtrack releases. I don't know, like Cafe Flesh. And um, that one that Pulse Video put out, I don't remember the name of it. I do apologize. It was a French one that... Um, I saw they put out, but this is one that would be great because you know, right from the beginning, you have this kind of variation on um, um, on Amazing Grace, where at first you don't even really kind of realize, and then you're like, oh, okay, you know, here it is, and then you get into these really uh, melancholic sort of themes, and I don't really know the best way to describe music, so I, I apologize, I really can't go into too much depth of it, but it all adds to something less erotic and more so. Uh, Sinister, but not in an aggressive way. Sinister in a way where it feels like there's something just like on the edge waiting to happen. I'm just, you're just waiting for that, that, that light to flip. And even with the sex scenes as well, I think they're all really interestingly shot in a way where there it feels like a natural progression of the... Um, the diminishing kind of um, mentality of this character because the first scene is shot 
in extreme, extreme close-ups. It's like, I mean, so the first one between Kim Pope and Eric Edwards, I mean, it, you, they have they have some shots where their face takes up the entirety of the screen. Um, there's a great shot where it's just kind of panning down from Kim Pope's breast to her lower abdomen, and it's tracking, and the entire screen is taken up on that, but in a way where it feels very loving and it feels very sensual and when they're together you know when 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 uh when richard and aggie are together and they and you know they they finish it's it doesn't it doesn't immediately cut it's just them in bed with this really great elongated close-up of of kim pope just looking right into the camera just this face of pleasure and it's very like satisfying but then when you get to the third part of this film when you get to that scene with um Darby Lloyd Reigns, and it's, her body movements are far more aggressive. They're far more. It's, it's, it's not quite as close up. It it feels like this is a character who's really kind of just really kind of letting loose into it. And you have the second scene as well. I should also say, with um, uh, with Harry Reams as well as um, Mary Stewart, which is uh, in the top of this barn. And um, then that scene as well. Actually, I got to mention that there are some th- there are some themes as well. As at one point she mentions it being like a fairy tale, and um, I think there's a it has to be intentional sort of a, a visual kind of um, metaphor of kind of Rapunzel because she's at the top of this barn. I mean that ha- I mean you know she's at the top looking out, saying her ma you know is, is locked her and she's not allowed to go anywhere. You know like Rapunzel. So you have Harry Reams who climbs up to get her, which you watch that scene and it's like. <laughs> I mean, they're filming in the winter, and, uh, man, I was watching, I was scared for Harry Reams, because he got on that ladder, man, and that ladder is shaking. I'm like, my man, you got to get up that ladder quicker. That thing's going to fall. You know? I was like, I don't know how icy that ground is. <laughs> so he really just kind of leaned it up against it, and that thing was shaking. I'm like, brother, you got to get the hell out of there. <laughs> it's ridiculous. But that scene as well feels intentional. But it feels like even going from the first to the second sex scene, um, you can sort of start to see a bit more of... Um, of uh, Aggie kind of losing herself in Richard, but then also still like the, the first part of that where she's really kind of being more forceful with them, but then it kind of goes into the sensual way. I don't know how intentional that is, but at least for the sake of the film, it, fe- it feels at least uh, in some ways um, like thoughtful. It feels like it was an, it was an act, it was a natural choice to do that to have these scenes kind of escalate from one another. There is, I mean, there's one in between that I think kind of goes into the conclusion. It's a solo scene with uh, Mary Stewart that I think is one of the reasons, one of the parts that kind of draw a conclusion at works. It's erotic, but it's very bizarre in what they choose to. I, I watched the film to see uh, exactly what it, what it is because it's, it's not, it's a, it's a taboo um, in a way that doesn't feel strictly like just a taboo. It does feel like there's something more with this character in the sequence. Although I don't know if it was the best idea to put the, put it that early on. I think if they had put it between the second and third um, sex scene, that would have, if if that's what they're going for, you know, with the idea, I think that would have made more sense in the narrative. Um, because early on it does kind of take you aback because that first sex scene is, is shot more traditionally, even with those extreme close-ups, whereas later on, <laughs> It feels a bit more in line um, uh, with those. I also noticed a couple things with the camera work. Um, before, when I was saying with these the panning kind of shots, I mean, those are all great. I mean, the landscapes in this film are really fantastic. This film was shot in Pennsylvania. Uh, I just had the name up right here. Anytime I need to get names or locations, it's always like I click one thing and then I, I lose out of it. But it's in Milanville, uh, Pennsylvania, in this small kind of town. And I mean, great open. There's this great open fields of snow. Um, there's this one really excellent shot where there's like this small kind of mini church at the top of this incline, with um, Deborah Shira and, P- and Patrick Ferrelli at the bottom, kind of walking. It's very picturesque, um, very gorgeous. Uh, it, I mean, it, it looks like I me. Mean, you got a great screen cap right there. But as well, um, there's like there was one shot early on that I thought was so well done where we pan from the right to the left of Deborah Shira to a waving kind of mirror. I mean, it is a mirror, but it's like kind of this waving effect. And then it's right there. We're at Kim Pope, and it was so seamlessly done and so natural 
that it was just fantastic. Um, because then even with that sequence with Kim Pope uh, going into the, into the Mary Stewart one, I mean, right there, you can look at it as, you know, I mean, Kim Pope is out there walking around, uh, and then she spots, you know, Eric Edwards on this bridge. Uh, you know, she's out on her own. But then when you have later on, when it's Mary Stewart and Harry Reams, and Mary Stewart's talking about how her ma won't let her go out, I mean, you can look at it as, is this a later, is this an, uh, uh, you know, if we are going by these different kind of memories, it's sort of like, well, who's who's really telling the truth here you know which version of aggie is really telling the truth and I, I think that's part of the reason why um it feels ambiguous maybe to a fault but in I, I still got enough out of it to draw my own conclusions when i say to a fault i mean it bring, brings the film down i just mean that i, I do kind of question some of the intentional uh, i do in questions uh, i do question some of the intentions with this um but with that said um the editing as well, uh, especially in the second half when it starts to get a bit more, um, not necessarily chaotic, but it definitely starts to amp up. There's this one great, really flashing kind of uh, image back and forth towards the end. And as well um, with the music, there's um, one shot uh, at the end where there's a review on there. There's a musical sting, and it just works so great as well. It's just, uh, it's just really fantastic the way they're able to do that. Oh, and one of the things I didn't even mention before in terms of the camera work as well, or the camera design, the camera, you know, shots, is that early on, I, I don't know if it was meant to be this way or not, but it does have this foggy sort of haze with the um, first scenes with uh, Kim Pope and Eric Edwards where it feels like a dream sort of because that's the one that, you know, Aggie says is the way she wants to kind of uh, match. She's like, she wants to imagine like that. And that's why I mean, they Richard, I mean, Richard's like, um, like, no, you didn't have blonde hair. That's not how it is. So... Perhaps, because that's the only part in the film where it has that uh, noticeably, don't even really want to say foggy, it's more just kind of like this haze on the camera that, that does give it that extra layer of being something almost kind of surreal, especially with how the scene ends as well. There's a great shot, especially, you know, what I'm talking about before is that where the camera is being placed, um, where she just turns, and it, with an edit, it's like perfect, I don't want to give it away, but it's like she turns, and then bam, it's like, perfect right there man it's it's got a really surreal kind of quality with that that's very consistent throughout even later scenes earlier uh, later scenes uh it when it's separated from these uh supposed flashbacks um it still has this sense of unease um i mean really i don't have a really a lot of problems with this film if any i mean it, it drag it doesn't drag it goes at a very good pace it's only about 75 minutes i think so i mean the only real downtime i would say this film has is really just one scene that i thought was maybe could have been done differently is when um you have um you have deborah Shearer outside because there's a cat inside she's like oh, i told you you know get out of here so she goes outside to take the cat out uh, but then she has this dialogue scene right there that I don't, it didn't totally work for me. Um, it's just a way to introduce it into the third scene by, again, you know, misremembering whether if there was even a cat there or not. Um, that was the only time where it felt a little, like, dialogue heavy in a way where it didn't totally work for me. Because, it, it, I mean, this is a very dialogue heavy film as well as having these great lapses of silence, not just with the sex, but with, you know, just getting with the atmosphere and having this great kind of moments of isolation and silence. But that was the only part, I would say, in particular, that stood out as feeling a little, um, not even hokey, but I would say it just felt a little uh, quickly done. But by the end of the film, man, I was just completely satisfied. I mean, if you're looking for... If you're looking for, I mean, this is one that I would go to to recommend to people who are not interested, who, who are interested in hardcore adult films, but are not interested so much in the sex. I know there is a softcore version of this film, uh, which I haven't seen, but I imagine is, is I don't know how much was cut out of there. I, I, I don't imagine you, didn't, you need to cut out a whole lot of this, because it's not as explicit as maybe one would expect. I mean, it, it is, it's hardcore and it's unsimulated, but it's not extreme in that regard. Um, but I meant, yeah, but if you're looking for more of a story, if you're looking for more of an art film, I think this is the one to go to, more so than um, his other work, because I know that he considers The Story of Joanna to be his favorite film, and I think that'll get an episode at some point of the show, but here, I, I feel like if you're just looking for a solid kind of pseudo somewhat not quite avant-garde film but something adjacent to that where you have these we have an unreliable narrator you have seemingly ambiguous dialogue um ambiguous choices and a conclusion that l answers a lot but also still raises some questions um this is a really unique film 
in its own right. And as well, it kind of highlights how unique of a filmmaker Damiano really was. About I would also recommend, um, and I think I've mentioned this before, if you get the opportunity to listen to the episode of the Rialto Report with um, Gerard Damiano Jr., as well as Eric Danville, who wrote the wonderful, um, the Complete Linda Lovelace book. Uh, and they, they talk, they, you know, Damiano Jr. talks about his experiences working with his dad, experiences as a kid on the set of Deep Throat, um, and uh, Eric Danville talks about his um, friendship with Linda Lovelace and the, the complicated uh, relationship that she had, um, not just with Chuck Trainer, but with the industry. And it's, it's a very fascinating episode that I, I think they should. And they also talk, about, talk a bit about the uh, dishonesty of the Lovelace film from 2013, um, which I'd be interested in rewatching just for contextual sakes. I remember not being that crazy about it when it came out, but knowing how much is disingenuous about it it kind of makes me curious to watch with that pers- with that new perspective knowing that you're we're not get- anyways that's another conversation what i'm saying is that listen to that episode because i think it will, will provide good insight because with damiano later on in his career when you get to the late 80s when you get to the the video store era when it's not about making films anymore it's about selling the box and everything else is secondary and you have filmmakers like this uh who are just not interested in selling the product, but but are looking to do something more with this kind of film. I find that so much more fascinating than anything that would have come from it. It's funny, actually. I recently watched the Wakefield Pool documentary, and they talk about later on um, uh, the later sequel he did, The Boys in the Sand, uh, and it, it just didn't, it, you know, a shot on video, and it just didn't have, I haven't seen Boys in the Sand, too. I mean, the first one is just a really solid film, but it, it's just funny looking at how well shot that is, even for as low a budget as this, and then you look at Boys in the Sand, too, which is done much later, and it doesn't, you know, and I know that film was made, you know, because Pool was desperate at the time, but but either way, it's just worth noting. But that's Memories from the Miss Aggie. Um, this has a wonderful uh, blurry out from Vinegar Syndrome. Uh, you can, I, I think it might be out of print now on their website, but you can find it pretty easily. It's, it's not a hard film to find, and I think that it's especially now with the 50th, um, we just had the 50th anniversary of Deep Throat um, a couple years ago. We had the 50th anniversary of Devil Miss Jones last year, and then we'll have the uh, 50th anniversary of the story of Joanna coming up. So it, it's a really great time to kind of put these films back into a uh, into a contextual state, into retrospective, and look at these with a uh, whole new appreciation that uh, maybe you didn't look at before. So X Memories Within Miss, Within Miss Aggie, it's a solid recommendation and one of the strongest films from this era. <laughs> So, thank you. I had many, I had much trouble trying to record this. Many technical issues there. So, if you're listening to this, then it all went well. And if not, well, then I've been talking into the ether. So, thank you guys for listening to this episode of Peephole Pictures. I appreciate it. If you made it this far, uh, that's all I got. So, thank you, thank you, thank you so much.